Hello and welcome to the next in our series of videos about the Dunkirk evacuation. This one is about Operation Dynamo, the Royal Navy evacuation of the troops. I'm sure the Army might have had a name for it as well, but uh, frankly I don't think they really cared what anybody else called it as long as they got off the beaches. So we'll start off in the southeast of the United Kingdom, the town of Dover, famous for the white cliffs made of a soft chalk. Actually, the cliffs go pretty much a long way along the coast, but Dover makes them famous. In the days before the Channel Tunnel, the main reason that folks may have heard of the place is because of its location for the shortest ferry crossing to the continent, the famous Dover to Calais run. Indeed, it is so close to France that in reasonable weather, the cliffs are quite visible to somebody on the far side of the channel. For the last thousand years, overlooking the port has been Dover Castle. It's the largest castle in England and is considered the key to England, given its position on the front line against its traditional enemy over that amount of time, France. Dover Castle has thus stood as the resolute image of British defiance to its enemies. Of greater interest to us, though, when talking about the events of Dunkirk in 1940, is not so much a castle itself, but instead what lies underneath it. Dover Command was an organization of the Royal Navy created during wartime by splitting off from Nor Command in order to pay particular attention to the cross-channel operations. Its headquarters and its commander, Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey, could be found in the tunnels which had been dug into the soft rock under Dover Castle back in the Napoleonic era. Admiral Ramsey was a destroyer captain in the previous war, part of Dover Patrol, and he knew the area well. He also liked to run his own show. In 1935, he retired when you felt he wasn't allowed the flexibility that he wanted. He was plucked out of retirement in the run-up to the World War II and appointed Commander-in-Chief Dover. With the British Expeditionary Force, and with it a substantial part of the British Army, in France, Admiral Ramsey's job was primarily to ensure that the supplies it needed made its way safely from the UK to France. Concerns were more to do with scheduling than with combat operations, as only the bravest U-boats would challenge the Royal Navy in such constricted waters. It was too far for the Luftwaffe to care about, and even the German Schnellboots were rare visitors. It was on the 19th of May that talk first really started about moving personnel from France to the UK. The Germans were doing well, but there was nothing evident to show that a large-scale disaster was imminent. The intent was to move maybe 2,000 useless mouths a day, starting the next day. But things took something of a turn on the 20th, though, with reports coming in from France that the BEF was about to be trapped and that an evacuation of the entire force was on the cards. Capacity for evacuation was accelerated to the level of maybe 10,000 troops a day embarked from Boulogne, Calais, and Dunkirk. It was, however, not a plan that the Germans were willing to support. Very quickly, Boulogne and Calais were taken off the table by the German advance. So this just left Dunkirk and most of a half million British forces. As with any operation worthy of the name, uh, a name first has to be created. The main planning room in the Dover tunnels was a large one, which in the previous war had housed machinery for the auxiliary lighting system for Dover Castle and it became known as a result as the Dynamo Room. The name for the operation planned and coordinated in that room thus became Operation Dynamo, officially assigned on the 22nd of May. To conduct his operation, Admiral Ramsey initially had a small command of about 35 civilian ships with just over a dozen or so destroyers. More was going to be needed, many more. And a shallow draft was looking to be a likely requirement Telephone calls were made to Nor Command and then the Admiralty in general. Get more destroyers. Fortunately, the Royal Navy had about two weeks prior to that started to catalog the various small boats which were available for contract or requisition. Uh, although they more had in mind the idea of looking for non-magnetic hulled boats for minesweeping purposes. Given the concern that the troops might have to be taken from the beaches directly, attention was made in the direction of these small boats given their shallow draft. However, simply going through the registrations was bad enough. Then there were issues of how to crew them, how to get the maps, how to defend them. This was going to take a while. In the meantime, the conclusion had been reached by London 
the evacuation of the full BEF would begin, and at 1857 came the signal from the Admiralty, Operation Dynamo is to commence. They expected to be able to lift about 45,000 men in two days, by which time they estimated that the BEF would, at best, no longer be able to embark, or at worst, would have been destroyed. In order to maximize capacity, stretcher cases would be left behind. They took up too much space. In the meantime, orders started going out for any spare destroyers to make for Dover. Trains were also requisitioned to get the disembarked troops from Dover to the camps further inland. The first ship of the official mission was a packet steamer named Mona's Isle. Arriving Dunkirk Harbor about midnight, she loaded up 1,420 persons and headed for home around sunrise. On the way home, she was shelled and strafed, losing 23 dead and 60 wounded. Two additional smaller ships met a similar fate. Sequocity was sunk. The problem was the hydrography of the channel. It is a wonderful word. As the Gulf flies, Dunkirk is 36 nautical miles from Dover. However, various banks and shoals prohibit a vessel of any reasonable draft from taking the Gulf's route, and deeper water is necessary. There are three known navigable routes, known, rationally enough, as X, Y, and Z. Not Z, it's English. The shortest route was Z, about 39 miles long, but it followed the coast of France about as far as Calais before turning right to be lined it over. The problem with this route was that with the Germans in control of the coast around Calais, this became very dangerous due to shelling, at least in daylight, as Mona's Isle and her colleagues found out. The next shortest route, X, at 55 miles, had the minor problem of having been mined by the Germans. This left only Y a long route of some 87 miles, which ran northeast, the wrong direction entirely, before turning due west to Ramsgate. Some miles could be shortened from the route by stopping at Ramsgate instead of continuing on to Dover, but this is still a very long round trip. 85 miles can be covered in reasonable time by a destroyer, but given that most cargo ships at the time would be doing well to hit 15 knots, ships would be spending more time at sea than picking up men. There was also the minor detail that this brought ships closer to the Schnellboot threat a small, high-speed craft armed with torpedoes, which had written off the French destroyer Jaguar earlier in the week. To make the th trip through Y safely, small convoys were set up. However, due to a mix-up in transmitted messages, a request to not to try to enter the main harbor due to German bombing ended up being received as Dunkirk captured Keep Clear. About 7,700 men were rescued that day, as men waited for ships which weren't coming. The shelling was intense. HMS Verity suffered a near mutiny, and she was taken off the runs for that night. The 27th also saw the Royal Air Force starting to lend a hand in force. Sixteen squadrons were allocated to provide top cover. Now, four things happened at this point. One, a reset of the convoys. A telephone line existed between Dunkirk and the UK, and the fact that Dunkirk had not fallen was made clear by phone. Secondly, an appeal came from emissaries sent by Lord Gort uh, to both the Chiefs of Staff and to Ramsey directly to send absolutely everything which could float. Thirdly, Admiral Ramsey asked for every destroyer which could be sent, not only those which were available. As a result, destroyers were taken off missions, from convoy to ASW duty, and then dispatched join the evacuation. The anti-aircraft cruiser Calcutta was also dispatched. She was an older six-inch gun cruiser who had had her main armament removed and replaced by dual-purpose four-inch mounts. And fourthly, a Captain William Tennant set out for Dunkirk aboard a destroyer, the commander of a 160 or so man shore party, whose job it would be to figure out how to get the men awaiting evacuation onto the ships. His title, Senior Naval Officer Dunkirk. Very quickly, he ascertained two things. Firstly, that the harbor was not going to be available for use due to being covered by enemy fire. And secondly, that the BEF command anticipated being able to hold Dunkirk for 24 to 36 hours. Also overnight, Captain Tennant observed that the harbor breakwaters, also known as moles, were apparently undamaged. Though they were not designed for use as piers and were basically 10-foot-wide wooden foundation structures, the possibility existed of using them by tying up alongside. An experiment was conducted, and Queen of the Channel, an 1,100-ton cross-channel passenger steamer, was ordered to try it out. 
Within a few hours, she was loaded with almost 1,000 troops. She was sunk on the way home by the Luftwaffe, with most of the men aboard being rescued by other ships. But the experiment had proved the feasibility of the mole and the possibility of loading troops by the hundred instead of by the dozen on rowing boats. The morning of the 28th, after arriving following another night run to France, the situation on the beaches was explained rather well by HMS Wakeful's transmission, Many Men, Few Boats. The very long, shallow sloping beach resulted in the destroyers having to stay almost a mile offshore at low tide, and thus were reliant only on their embarked small craft to row persons from the beach. The effort to find shallow draft boats redoubled, and anything from river boats through lifeboats through the new army landing craft were being sought out for service. Also present for duty was the Polish destroyer Bliskowice. The next problem came further up the coast at Bredun. Reports were filtering in of up to 5,000 men waiting at the beach. When Captain Tennant sent an officer to investigate, it turned out the number was actually 25,000. After an initial attempt to simply transfer men from beach to waiting ships by boats, it was considered that perhaps it would be more efficient to simply march the men to Dunkirk and use the mole. With destroyers now taking almost 1,000 men at a time at the mole, and in addition to the increased beach offtake, the rescue tally for the 28th was just shy of 18,000. So even getting the estimated 45,000 men was looking difficult. But it wasn't for lack of effort of the ships present. HMS Sabre took off some 1,500 men in three trips in that one day. By that night, Route X was declared free of mines, which knocked off a couple hours from the return trip. Uh, this was just as well. HMS Wakeful was sunk by Schnellboots at the most easterly part of Route Y that night. As a group of ships started picking up survivors, HMS Grafton was itself torpedoed, this time by a U-boat. This started a melee of confusion as British ships fired upon and even deliberately rammed each other. The amount of rescued soldiers from Dunkirk who ended up in further peril as a result of this caused a moderately cold-blooded instruction to come from Dover. If carrying troops do not stop to aid survivors. In a fairness, it wasn't as if they were going to be left to the horrors of the North Atlantic, uh, though, okay, the water was relatively warm, and it was also well enough traffic that an empty ship would have been along soon enough. The first artificial pier was created on the 29th. A riverboat, Oriole, which had had a very shallow draft, simply beached herself bow on. Uh, this meant that the little boats, being used to ferry the personnel to the ships, no longer had to fight the surf to get away from the beach. Soldiers climbed on the bow of the ship, walked aft, and then boarded the little boats at the stern. She unbeached herself at the next high tide after some 2,500 men had used her as a pier. Similarly, the mole was in heavy use on the 29th. A dozen ships were clustered around it when the skies cleared for the first time in two days late that afternoon. Flieger Corps 8, uh, reinforced as some 400 aircraft, set upon them. Several ships did not come off very well for the experience. Jaguar, the British destroyer this time, took sufficient damage to knock her out of the operation, although she made it back to Dover under tow. Grenade, tied inboard of her, took a lot of hits. Casting off, she was towed out of the harbor uh, just before she blew up. Then two trawlers, Calvi and Fenella, were put to the bottom. The Royal Navy commander in charge of the mole operations, a Canadian by the name of Clouston, had to draw his revolver and threaten to shoot the soldiers who were, understandably enough, trying to get back off the mole. The ships were, after all, risking themselves to get them back to the UK, and they wouldn't achieve that result if the soldiers ran away from the ships. Not that being on the ships was any guarantee of safety either. The larger paddle steamer Crested Eagle took a hit and had to beach herself. The men found themselves back on the beach. Losses continued to mount. A ferry, a passenger steamer, and minesweeper also were sent to the bottom by the Luftwaffe with hundreds of lives lost. The evening of the 29th, the news started coming into Dover from France, and it was not good. Indeed, the messages, garbled through the fog of war, were that, again, Dunkirk Harbor was out of action, even the mole, and the evacuation had to come from the beaches. The confusion was not remedied until the next morning when a destroyer sent to investigate reported, well, actually, the arbor could still be accessed. At this point, Ramsey's fleet was dramatically reduced. With destroyers being knocked out of the fight at a rapid pace, three were totally sunk and an additional six heavily damaged, the Admiralty pulled out the more modern ships with the intent of preserving them for other duties in the future. 
This was a similar decision to that made by the RAF a few weeks earlier when headquarters refused to send any more aircraft to France to try to save the country. It wasn't an entirely unreasonable conclusion. Uh, the entire G-class was now either in repair or at the bottom of the sea. With no indication that the enemy activity would let up, and with the destroyers being the fastest transport to and fro, this was something of a double whammy of a loss of defensive firepower and of carrying capacity. The 15 destroyers Ramsey was left with were older ones, which the Navy felt they could better afford to lose if any more had to be sunk. Despite the losses, though, it was a good day. Over 47,000 troops made it home. Reinforcements for Captain Tennant came on the morning of the 30th in the form of Rear Admiral Wake Walker. The problem was that although Captain Tennant was doing sterling work marshalling troops to get onto ships, he couldn't effectively control the flow of the ships coming in in the first place. So frequently the ships would show up where the troops weren't and vice versa. Admiral Wake Walker would be his seaborne counterpart, floating off Dunkirk and directing ships to wherever it was that Tennant needed them. The efforts were helped by misty weather, which reduced the attacks by the Luftwaffe. Two more artificial piers were created, these more permanent ones by driving out trucks at low tide, tying them together, placing planking on the roofs, and then waiting for the tide to come in. These were local initiatives by the ground troops. One, known as the Provost Jetty, was a joint enterprise by a military police unit which appropriated the trucks, and an engineer unit which built the pier. The ease of loading without the distraction of attacks, however, was countered a little bit by the lack of shipping, uh, particularly the small boats needed to get to the beaches. As a result, yet again, the potential lift was not attained, although the overall numbers were still on an upward trajectory. Over 53,000 men were landed in the UK. What Ramsey could not see, although he would have been academically aware of the activity, was a collection of a flotilla of what would be known as the Little Ships in Sheerness, where the River Medway meets the Thames Estuary. There were ships and boats of all sizes, from cockleboats to lifeboats, all of which were found after a thorough search of the boatyards of the area. Over the past few days, boats were being delivered by their owners or simply requisitioned if the owners could not be found. That did not stop the fundamental problems of getting manpower for the trip or the fact that very few Royal Navy personnel were familiar with the huge variety of machinery which powered these vessels. The personnel shortage was somewhat rectified by enlisting, on for a few days, the crews of these craft into the Navy on a volunteer basis. Generally speaking, the crews were up for it. Do their part and a bit of an adventure from the normal, boring routine of things. Their innocence was soon to be broken. The 30th saw the craft moved to Ramsgate for a final pit stop before crossing en masse to Dunkirk, arriving later that day and providing a spurt for the numbers of troops loaded from the beaches. More reinforcements were also forthcoming. Admiral Ramsey's persistence in arguing with London paid off and the destroyers which had been previously withdrawn from the operation were returned. If the job was worth doing, it was worth doing properly. And it wasn't as if they weren't needed. Two more destroyers, these ones were both French, were sent to the bottom. Finally, to add one additional little wrinkle to the whole situation, which was now finally proceeding at a reasonable pace, the workload just increased, because the Prime Minister had decided that in a show of solidarity, an equal amount of French soldiers must be removed from Dunkirk per day as English. Up until then, the traffic to Dover was primarily a British movement. The French, being evacuated mainly by French resources, were simply being removed from the trap and landed back in France further west to continue to defend their home country. Now, there were some exceptions. Uh, of the day's 53,000 evacuees, some 8,500 were French. But this was mainly due to British ships picking up someone, anyone, if there were no British soldiers nearby to be picked up. However, the end result was that not only did the amount of personnel in the pocket for the Royal Navy to be worried about almost double to some 400,000 plus, but from a purely domestic concern that also meant that you were leaving British troops in danger of falling victim to the German army for more days. The 31st brought yet more problems. The seas, which had been surprisingly calm for the previous few days, turned rough. This added yet another challenge to these small boats that were trying to get through the surf and avoid getting capsized by too many soldiers trying to get aboard. Emphasis had to change to Dunkirk and the Mole. The Mole itself started receiving the attentions of German artillery, which had finally come into range. 
Together with the risk of around simply impacting the structure, the ships were sitting ducks, and troops had to run a gauntlet of indirect fire to get to those ships. The rough seas did not, however, preclude occasional visits from the Luftwaffe. So now, boats were fighting aircraft, artillery, seas, and landlubber soldiers who didn't know how to get into a boat without tipping it over. 68,000 men, of whom almost 11,000 were French, was the tally for that day. Arguably, things turned even more for the worse on the 1st of June. A bright, clear, sunny day, and it was obvious that the Luftwaffe would be back and in force. The first victims were the destroyer Keith and minesweeper Skipjack. They were gone by 9 a.m., and it set a tone for the rest of the day. The destroyer Havant spectacularly blew up over an hour later. This was despite the change in tactics by the RAF. In a manner somewhat reminiscent of the Big Wing, which would be introduced in the Battle of Britain, the RAF decided to place its bets by putting fighters up en masse, but for less time. Any German raid which happened over the beach at the same time as several squadrons of Spitfire were coincidentally overhead was going to have rather a bad time of it. However, the downside was that there were also going to be times where there was no RAF fighter to be seen at all. And the result of that was that the Royal Navy and the enthusiastic volunteers on the smaller craft were themselves going to have a rather bad time of it. Ships which returned to the UK started seeing their crews refuse to make another trip. Being defenseless target is perhaps not an appealing concept to people used to taking passengers to the Channel Islands or firemen who save lives on London's riverbanks. Solutions varied from stiffening up the crews with Royal Navy personnel, replacing the crew entirely, although that wasn't ideal as it soaked up rare manpower, or simply giving the crew time to rest and recover. In all cases, however, it meant that ships had to remain idle. Sometimes it wasn't even the enemy fire which left the mark. The piece of one night transit was shattered when a boat hit a mine and was obliterated. Still, more boats than not made the trip again, and the tally for the 1st of June was over 64,000. And this time, more French than British were evacuated, the French generally being picked up from the Western Mole and the beaches to the west. The RAF's efforts notwithstanding, however, the French coast was simply becoming too hot. Evacuations would no longer happen by daylight, if at all possible. Ramsey held the destroyers back in the UK, and Captain Tennant messaged that any ships in Dunkirk needed to be gone by 3 a.m. Captain Tennant also mentioned in his message that he anticipated that the evacuation would be completed the following night. This wasn't so much hopelessly optimistic, some 140,000 French and British troops remained in the pocket, as much as an acceptance that the perimeter was simply not expected to hold out much longer. Since the embarkation was now happening in the hours of darkness only, that immediately cuts down your maximum capacity. A slow start to the evening turned into a mass of soldiers by 11 p.m. showing up uh, to be lifted off, to the point that thousands were waiting on the mole when the last ship left for the day. 26,000 men were returned to the UK. The saving grace was that the units now arriving in Dunkirk were the disciplined fighting forces which had been holding the line. There was no particular panic and they set about fortifying themselves for the next day. The next morning, 02 June, Admiral Ramsey sent out a signal challenging the fleet for the last push. A massive wave of ships would descend upon Dunkirk that night in one concentrated effort. Anyone not aboard by 3 a.m. on the 3rd would not be coming home. The fleet arrived on time and started taking up the last of the British Expeditionary Force. One of the last aboard was General Alexander, commanding the remaining force after Lord Gort had been ordered forcefully uh, to return. The last man of the 1st King's Shropshire Light Infantry stepped off the mole onto the waiting vessel, and the BEF was officially withdrawn from France. The biggest problem was navigational. With so many ships in close concert, collisions were inevitable. The second problem was that there were empty ships. The British had gone but the French were missing. Before daylight, the Royal Navy went home. Unknown to the British, the French were fighting hard, keeping the Germans out of Dunkirk, but the fighting was too fierce to allow them to disengage. Some 30,000 Frenchmen remained in Dunkirk. There was no honorable choice. Admiral Ramsey signaled that once more, a run was necessary to pick up those who fought so that the British could come home. Famously, the destroyer Malcolm had planned a celebratory formal dinner that night, on the reasonable but mistaken presumption that the operation was over. Well, they had their party anyway. The ship put to sea with the crew still wearing their bow ties.
26,000 men, almost entirely French, were rescued that day. The last warship to leave was the 20-year-old destroyer HMS Shikari, packed to the gunnels, but still leaving hundreds of well-disciplined French troops behind, standing in formation, not breaking ranks as the reality of capture faced them. An ignominious end to some of France's best fighters. Losses continued, however, with additional ships going down both to ramming and to mines laid by the Luftwaffe. By the time the operation was declared officially over at 1423-04 June, 243 vessels of all sizes had been lost. The RAF lost almost 150 aircraft, which would be sorely missed in the Battle of Britain only a few months hence. Most importantly though, the Royal Navy and its allies had transported 366,162 personnel, almost a third of them French, from France to the UK. This provided the nucleus for the British Army to rebuild and return to the continent four years later. So that's the story of Dunkirk from the fall of France to how the Navy got everybody home. Hope you found it all somewhat interesting and as ever, I'm Nicholas Moore the Chieftain and I'll see you on the next one.